Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchmen Studios with another Watchmen video broadcast. I'm not one to go back and dig up old information, but a couple things that I had previously mentioned about Betty Andreessen's whole UFO alien lifestyle. Uh, number one, you remember when we first started doing this series last month, I talked about that, uh, that blue light that circled her head when she was about 12 or 13 years old. You remember that? Let me put it up on the screen for you to re refresh your memory. Uh, these are drawings that Betty did herself of this uh, when she was about 12 or 13 years old, her first encounters, her first memories of alien contact. And, you know, this is what really got my attention was, you know, this blue light touching her forehead, you know, like pow, and she feels stuff inside of her brain and all of a sudden, you know, and, and you remember that, right? Because it had to do with the whole Shakti pod and slain in the spirit nonsense. Because anyway, because it touched her in the forehead and she passed out, falls backward, and we dealt with all that, right? Well, there's a movie. Don't watch it. I know some of you are going to now. I hate to even bring this up, but it, I think it's relevant. Because I'm, I'm somebody that believes the Bible. I believe uh, Ephesians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians 2, verse 2, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. And of course this world is on course to have Antichrist revealed to it according to the prince of the power of the air you know, the one prince that's in charge of all the aliens, all the UFOs, all the devils, evil angels, unclean spirits, you name it. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. She's one of them. Betty Andreessen is one of them. And uh, the people who write comic books, movie scripts, TV show scripts, commercials, put advertisements on TV and on the internet and all of the people in the UFO movement. There was a movie that came out several years ago and it was about a gray alien that escaped out of Area 51. It's supposed to be sort of like a comedy slash action adventure slash science fiction slash this, slash that, you know, jumbled, all jumbled up into this movie, and it was called Paul. That's the name of the little gray alien that escapes out of Area 51, and he uh, is going to try to go to the rendezvous point so that he can be rescued by his gray alien brothers who are going to meet him, guess where? Devil's Tower, Wyoming, the scene of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, okay? The, and, and they, um, I, one of the actors that was in this movie, don't watch it, please don't watch it, okay? Because it's F-bomb city. You'll, you'll, you'll just be irritated by it. It's like, you know, a bunch of sixth graders wrote this movie and they got to use the F word a lot. Okay, because that's what's in it. Anyway, the reason why I bring this up, there's a scene in this movie that matches exactly what happened with Betty Andreessen. Well, I say exactly, it matches. Because Betty Andreessen's whole life story is that she, had, and especially since you know, I showed you her drawing of the one, um, her whole life story is that she has this new divine revelation now, even though she says she believes the Bible, she has this divine revelation from these angels, these little gray, black-eyed angels that she entertained that have given her a superior knowledge now that has shaped her view of what she reads in this Bible. 
And there's a scene in there uh, because the, the movie basically, I don't know how long it is, hour and a half, two hours, something like that, but it's basically a commercial for the, it's sort of like Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind and um, um, E.T., which is referenced in Paul, the movie. Um, it's like a commercial for the aliens are the good guys. They're here to help us. Why don't we get off our Bible Christianity high horse? That's what it's about. Because there's a woman in this movie called Paul who is being raised by a fundamentalist Christian father who reads a Bible and carries a shotgun and is going to shoot them aliens, right? And she has a problem with her left eye. And she has this pair of glasses where the left eye is darkened. You know, who? that's why I quoted this verse. The prince of the power of the air writes all these movie scripts. So anyway, here's, you know, there's two, two things involving this young girl because she ends up with the two main characters in the movie and the gray alien, and she's been raised as fundamentalist Christian Bible believer, and she's, she's calling this a, a demon, a devil from Satan, from hell, you know. And finally, the alien is going to alter her consciousness. Now, let me show you this, and all, all it is a screen capture because, you know, YouTube throws a fit every time I show you a clip of the movie. It's not my movie. I didn't make the movie. But I'll show you a screen capture of it. Uh, and here is Paul. He's laying hands on her third eye, her, you know, her kundalini shaktipat, pineal gland, third eye. And all of a sudden, it starts flashing all this images into her mind of everything that Paul the alien knows about the universe, the truth about the universe, not the Bible. The Bible's a lie, okay? It's, and, and he's giving her a new truth now. He's downloading it into her consciousness so that she immediately then doesn't believe the Bible anymore. She's not this fundamentalist Christian. And this comes out in the movie. She wants to go and explore sin. And I'm not going to say any more than that. Don't watch it. Don't. Don't, okay? No, there's no nudity in it. Just don't watch it. It's not a good movie, all right? Um, but that's what he does. He touches her on the forehead like you see Benny Hinn and everybody else has been slain in the Spirit and all these other people, and all of a sudden now they have this, they call it baptism of the Holy Spirit, where they are slain in the Spirit, and now they have a new consciousness. Now they have a new awareness. Now they have a superior mind, even superior to the Bible. And some of these people say they don't need the Bible anymore because God speaks directly to them and he doesn't use the Bible. Same thing. Same thing with Betty Andreessen. Same thing that was featured in this movie. And then in pretty much the same scene, we go to the next clip. He tells, that Paul the alien tells her exactly what's wrong with her left eye. And she's like, how did you know that? He said, oh, lucky guess. No, he knew exactly what was wrong. And he's going to heal her. So look at how he heals her. And then he says these words, it's okay, you can trust me. Just have a little faith. Are you, ki are you kidding me? Have a, little, have a little faith? Do you not get this? They named him Paul for a reason. Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament. And the New Testament's about faith. But it's not faith in devils. Yeah, if you want to make fun of me as a fundamentalist, Bible-believing, shotgun-owning Christian, go ahead. But we're not wrong. We're not wrong when we have faith and trust in the Word of God we're not wrong when we call these aliens devils, demons, evil angels, fallen angels, unclean spirits, every foul and hateful bird. We're not wrong on this. And 
I can tell you story after story. I've watched videos, read books, read parts of books where the aliens healed people that they abducted, took their cancer away, took their back pain away, healed their shoulders, healed their knees, healed their eyes, healed, did all kinds of things. And that's why so many people now, this is why Jesus warned the Jews against signs and wonders. And he wasn't just warning the Jews. He was warning all the people who are looking for signs and wonders because the false prophet is going to perform signs and wonders. So that's the first thing that I wanted to kind of back up a little bit on the Betty Andreessen story with her being touched in the forehead by this blue alien light thing, this devil, was I remembered that that showed up in the movie Paul. I watched it a few years ago. I had a copy of it legally and uh, went back and looked at it last night and I went, yeah, I'm going to back up on this. And then the second thing I want to back up on um, is if you remember, um, Betty Andreessen saw a lot of weird things. You remember the crystal, um, sort of the crystal world. I won't call it a planet because I don't, I don't know. I don't know that I even believe that the aliens took her to a planet where everything was crystal, but she is in, she is telling what she has in her brain because Andreessen says that she was given downloads. That's how she drew the one. And a lot, a lot, I featured this on Pastor Mike Online, a lot of the abductees, alien people, UFO people, have all of a sudden got mysterious downloads of knowledge. And I could tell you story after story after story where people are getting instantaneous consciousness revelations that didn't come from reading the Bible or didn't come from meditating on the Word of God. It came by way of some supernatural thing where all of a sudden now they have a new awareness of things. We were told to read our Bibles for revelation. That's what we were told, all right? So anyway, Betty Andreessen, you know, has all of these along with all these other alien, uh, alien abductees and so on. And there was, a, there was a scene in Betty, and again, this is her artwork. You remember the, you remember the butterfly? And I should have thought of this when I was talking about it, but it did not occur to me. But I still... I then thought about the imagery of and the symbolism of the butterfly. In case you haven't seen it, go back and watch that. But very quickly, she sees this crystal butterfly. There it is on the screen. She touches it. It turned to life. It, the butterfly came to life when she touched it. And for a short period of time, the colors were vibrant, black, blue, and green, it flew around for a while, the color began to dissipate, it turned into a drop of water, and then the, when the water dropped, it turned back into this crystal butterfly. So let me, I, again, I should have, should have occurred to me the symbolism of the butterfly. Why was it, why were the aliens showing her all this weird stuff? And why a butterfly? I preached a message several years ago called uh, From Worms to Butterflies because it occurred to me that, you know, we, one of these days, we're going to be transformed from this vile body into a new body, right? Well, the symbolism of the butterfly, let's examine that for a few minutes. Take a look at this. This is, of course, Manly Hall, Secret Teachings of All Ages, and here's what he says, the butterfly the emblem of metamorphosis. You know what that word means? Transformation. Change. Changing from one form to another because they're not born as butterflies. How, are the, how do they start out? Let's look at something else Manley Hall said. He said in the Secret Teachings of All Ages, he said the butterfly under the name of Psyche which is a beautiful maiden with wings of opalescent light, 
Let me stop right here. Anytime you have a goddess, it doesn't matter what her name is, whether it's Psyche, a muse, a female fairy, um, Diana, Ashtaroth, Isis, Ishtar, Shingmu, anytime you have a goddess, you are dealing with mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. That's who you're dealing with. So she is a goddess under all of these different names, but that's the spirit that we're dealing with here. So understand that when Manly Hall talks about the butterfly under the name of Psyche, which was a beautiful maiden with wings of light. We're talking about Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots, and wherever her spirit is, that's the other spirit, the opposite of the Holy Spirit. So the butterfly under the name of Psyche, a beautiful maiden with wings of opalescent light, symbolizes the human soul because of the stages it passes through in order to unfold its power of flight. Think angels or humans to gods. The three divisions through which the butterfly passes in its unfoldment resemble closely the three degrees of the mystery school. Which degrees are regarded as consummating the unfoldment of man by giving him emblematic wings by which he may soar to the skies. Now, this is going to segue into what we're going to talk about, which is the, the grand finale of Betty Andreessen's story. She went through a ritual. She was inducted by a ritual, all right? So this figures into that, what was the symbolism of the butterfly. Unregenerate man, ignorant and helpless, is symbolized by the stage between ovum and larva, the disciple seeking truth and dwelling in medication, by the second stage from larva to pupa, at which time the insect enters its chrysalis, which is the tomb of the mysteries, the third stage from pupa to imago, wherein the perfect butterfly comes forth, typifies the unfolded enlightened soul of the initiate rising from the tomb of his baser nature. When he mentions the three degrees of the mystery school, we're also, we can also look at the three degrees of the blue lodge of Freemasonry. You, you're given the third, why are you giving me the third degree? You're given the third degree because in the third degree, you are Hiram Abiff. You are the dying God who needs to die so he can rise again. So you're beat in the forehead, you're hit three times. That's the three degrees. This is what Manley Hall was getting at in the three stages of the butterfly and its transformation. So you are the candidate, you fall backward, and you, with the strong grip of the lion's paw, you're raised back to life again, and now you're, a, you're the new man. You have been transformed. Now you're a god. Now you have a higher consciousness. Now you have a superior knowledge. Now you are in the good old boys club, right? And you get special favors handed to you all throughout your life, but that won't get you into heaven. It won't. So anyway, Take a look at, I mean, I just looked this up on what hap, how a butterfly comes into being. It's not born a four-winged butterfly. Yes, it has four wings. And what does that number represent? The spiritual realm and the gospel. So the four stages of transformation, the female butterfly lays eggs on a leaf, that's stage one there on the bottom. When those eggs hatch, out comes a worm, a caterpillar of some type. The caterpillar then makes its own casket, which is the chrysalis. And when the caterpillar goes into the casket, the chrysalis, it goes dormant, sort of like sleeps the sleep of death. And then at a certain point, it is transformed into these beautiful, and butterflies are beautiful. Moths, not so much, but they're related, right? Butterflies are beautiful, all right? And they have four wings. So that number four, Joel chapter one, because 
ultimately we're talking about an alien invasion. When you talk about alien invasion, you have to bring in Joel's army because they are an army of aliens invading earth. Joel 1, verse 4, that which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, that which the canker worm hath the left hath the caterpillar eaten. Notice there's four worms here. So we know he's not talking about just regular old everyday dirt, grub, worms, or maggots, or caterpillars, or anything. We're talking about spirits. The spirits that consume away that which the food that we need, causing a famine. When locusts fly through and eat everything, and then when they what they leave, the canker worm or the palmer worm or the caterpillar comes and eat what's left, then your cattle don't have anything to eat, then you don't have anything to eat, then everybody dies. So spiritually, it's like these spirits. The fowl of the air come down, consume the word of God, the seed. Now it's gone. Now everybody dies. That's the symbolism of it. It's the same promise in Genesis 3 that Satan promised Eve, you sh if you'll eat of that fruit, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You'll have this instantaneous download of knowledge of good and evil, and you'll be like the gods, knowing good and evil. You'll be immortal. You'll be transformed, and I promise you there is a transformation coming. The four wings of the butterfly give you the indication, and the whole life of the butterfly shows us transformation. And just like with angels, there are good angels and bad angels, with transformation, there is a good transformation, the rapture, the resurrection, and a bad transformation whereby people are going to receive a body and that body is going to be thrown into the lake of fire for all of eternity. It's symbolized by the four wings of the butterfly. And those four wings are symbolic of what we find in Ezekiel chapter 1. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of the four living creatures. This was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. So they had a humanoid appearance. And everyone had four faces and everyone had four wings. The four faces, the four wings, shows you that they're not from this realm, even though it says it came out of the north. How many directions are there? And the north just seems to be, and I'm going to get to that eventually, just seems to be where the portal is. Even in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, when they are at Devil's Tower instead of the mountain of God, when they're at Devil's Tower, the radar says we have all these targets coming from the north, northwest. Where did the aliens come from in close? They came from the north. Go figure that, right? But then, here's what I like. Butterflies, some of them have designs on their wings. This is something that God did. Evolution, evolution is stupid. And Paul, the movie, Paul is all about evolution. He's like an evolved being, and he wants humanity to be like him. Evolution says that butterflies' DNA figured out that they wouldn't be eaten by predators if they looked like bigger predators. So some of the butterflies, when you look at them, looks like an owl is staring back at you. Take a look. Look at that. It looks like an owl. Or the one there on the right, it looks like a giant spider because that looks like spider eyes. Spiders have a bunch of eyes. It looks like an owl looking back at you. Now, what, what makes evolutionists think? God does, I guess. But they don't think right. They think that the butterfly DNA wrote itself how to make wings that look like owl eyes so it wouldn't be eaten by predators. And there's thousands, I guess, or hundreds, I don't know how many different uh, similarities in nature where certain creatures disguise themselves so they won't be eaten, like walking sticks and walking leaves and you name it, so they won't get eaten by predators. They, you, evolution doesn't do that. God did. I, 
I'm not going to apologize. I'm, I'm a fundamentalist, Bible-believing, shotgun-owning Christian. No, I don't want to shoot anybody, but I believe the Bible. And I believe that we were created in the image of God, and God created everything in six literal days. Either like it or don't, but I'm not changing my mind because God already has. Amen? Revelation 4. This, this is what I like. Because in Ezekiel 1, in Revelation 4, you have two views of the same scene, pretty much. Um, in the Old Testament, God has to come down to Ezekiel. Isn't that neat? But in the New Testament, John goes up to God. Beautiful. I love it. But they're seeing the throne of God. And so Ezekiel sees it little bit one way john sees it a little bit another way but here's what john sees those same angels the four beasts each of them had six wings about them and they were full of eyes within look at that just like butterfly wings full of eyes see a butterfly is a picture of an angel where it came from is a picture of you and i the eggs that the we came from eggs not chicken eggs, not butterfly eggs, but human eggs, right? Our soul is the worm, and our soul is transformed so that we are like the angels of heaven. Amen? So that's the good transformation, but there is a different transformation. First Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, that's the bad transformation. Born again of corruptible seed. That's what everybody else is going to get. We're not. We are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Genesis 6, 11, The earth. So here is, here is the bad transformation. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way, upon the earth. If you remember back in Genesis 6, uh, Genesis 1, when God created everything, he beheld it and looked and saw it was good. Now, six chapters later, he looks at it and says, it's corrupt. All flesh, I believe it, all flesh had corrupted its way and God had to destroy it because it was transformed, changed somehow, probably DNA manipulation, we don't know really how it was done. We know the angels, sons of God, made it with the daughters of men. We know that much. Genesis 3. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Ye, as humans, shall be like us gods. And I'm telling you, if you've heard of one alien story, you've heard them all. Because the aliens are the ones laying credit to mankind being on this earth. The aliens say, we put you here. It's our little experiment, and we don't like how it's going, so we're going to intervene. But we're going to evolve you like we're evolved, and we're going to make you like us. That's why we're having to abduct so many people, because we're trying to figure out how to hybridize you. And we're doing weird things with cows. I don't really know what all that's about yet but anyway um that's the that's the story of the aliens they're they're it's falling right in with daniel chapter 2 they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men so the slain in the spirit thing with betty andreessen you know that that i get the butterfly thing now now you understand why the aliens were showing her some of this all this weird stuff that was going on and she uh, why wasn't it a chicken, that a crystal chicken, right? Or a crystal mosquito or a, you know, crystal goldfish or something. No, it had to be a crystal butterfly because that is a cult language for transformation. That's what that is. She was told, do you, everything that you've seen, do you understand it? She said, no, I don't understand it. But they said, but we want you to tell everybody. So she has. So they planted this secret idea of the butterfly and its transformation because that's what's coming down the road 
for mankind. So now, um, back to Betty Andreessen, and we're going to move forward from here and talk about the ritual that she went through to be initiated. Okay? And again, this comes from the books that I have, The Andreessen Affair by Ray Fowler, The Andreessen Affair, Phase 2, again by Ray Fowler, Lifting of the Veil, written by Betty Andreessen, Luca, and Bob Luca, which is her second husband. Although we're not really told exactly where uh, she was taken, she doesn't know. She just knows that when she was taken back out of the ship, she sees and describes this place that she's in as a place where there is a misty fog. And the, again, this is her artwork, not bad. She describes this misty fog everywhere, these dark gray forms, and these ovals in the background. She says, she wrote on there, I thought they were machines of some kind. So what's up with this misty fog place that she's in? Well, there's a couple references in the Bible concerning mist. If you remember in the days of Genesis, that um, before the flood of Noah, there was no rain on the earth, but a mist ascended up out of the ground. But there's a couple references to that sort of give us an idea of who's behind the abduction of Betty Andreessen and where she might really be. The first one, Acts chapter 13, where Paul, Paul it starts out calling Saul, then Paul. That's sort of Paul's transformation. And Saul is trying to witness to Sergius Paulus, this deputy of the country that he's in, and, and lead him to Jesus. But there is a false prophet who doesn't like Paul giving away free salvation when all the false prophets make you pay for it, right? So he tries to subvert what Paul's doing, and Paul calls him out on it. He calls him, you child of the devil, you, right, to the false prophet. So in Acts chapter 13, verse 11, 11 is the number for fogginess. The number for chaos, and I can't really see what that is. So in verse 11, Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. And he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. In 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2 is talking about all the false prophets throughout all the ages, including this age, especially this age here. And he says there's something reserved for these false prophets, something they should already be familiar with, because their view of Scripture and their ability to teach Scripture is at best foggy. So he says, 2 Peter 2.17, these are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. The mist of darkness. See, the, the mist, the fog, blocks the sun light, right? The sun is Christ, the light of the world, the light of the Word of God. So the mist and the fog, the mist of darkness, is the absence of of knowing what this book says. So understand now, this is a woman who claims to be a fundamentalist, born-again, Bible-believing Christian. I don't know if she owns a shotgun or not, but that's who she claims to be. But everything that I've read about her and by her own words tell me She's in a fog and a mist of darkness. So she was taken to a place that was foggy and misty and these dark gray forms, I can't tell what they are type thing. She doesn't understand. And her concept, again, her concept of who the one is and who God is, that is not match what this Bible says. 
From the pages of these books, there's a couple things I want to draw your attention to about Betty. Number one, the aliens who spoke to Betty that January night spoke of Jesus as, quote, coming soon. How would they know? How would they know? They don't. Not, none of the angels do. None of them do. No man knows. Not even the Son of Man, only God the Father. And it's written down, and he's going to tell his son, okay, now go. Okay? So these aliens, they're lying through. The, she still believes they're angels, right? The aliens who spoke to Betty that January night spoke of Jesus as, quote, coming soon. They also told Betty not to fear because the Lord is with her. Betty has never wavered in her belief that her gray abductors are angelic creatures preparing the way for the second coming of Christ. Oh, my God goodness. She then must believe that they are Elijah or John the Baptist. During Betty's UFO experiences, there was always a light within giving her strength, for she believes the beings she has been involved with are angels or messengers sent by our Creator, the One who wants us to embrace who we are and connect to the divine plan that has been in place since the beginning of time. That Again, that's Betty Luca's own words, lifting the veil. That sounds like every New Age thing you've ever heard, every occult thing you've ever heard. That sounds like every alien UFO thing I've ever heard. Only in her context, they mingled Christianity in with the alien agenda or the devil agenda. Okay, that's what they did. They mixed in her background knowledge of Christianity in with their plan and she, in her mind, because she has this inner light now, right? Uh, which is not the word of God. She has mingled these two things together and they're incompatible. It's like iron and miry clay. They don't, they don't mix together. So now, uh, Ray Fowler has a hypnotist and he has Betty laying on the couch and they're doing a regression and Ray Fowler writes about something that she's going to encounter. So let's look at what Ray Fowler wrote in the book, The Andreessen Affair. This is what this, is what this was all about. This is what got my attention and we're not, sadly we're not going to finish it today. You know me. June 23rd was a Thursday. Our next hypnotic regression session was scheduled for that evening. The summer sun still shone as investigators and witnesses filed into the offices of the New England Institute of Hypnosis. We were totally unprepared for what was about to take place. Betty was about to undergo the most painful and emotional segment of her total experience. Her suffering and ecstasy. Those are contradictions, by the way. Her suffering and ecstasy would be contagious. What we were about to witness would become etched indelibly on our minds and in some hearts. And this is from the Andreessen Affair. Now, I'm not going to read you what she witnessed, but let me introduce, as we lead up to that, the phoenix. What is the phoenix? Well, you look at it, this is not a photograph. Apparently, we don't have a photograph of a phoenix bird. So, Manley Hall, all the other writers, modern writers, Wikipedia, encyclopedias, different books, uh, would say that this is a mythological bird. Um, somebody saw something and mistook it for something else, and that's how myths arise. And so, at, verily, throughout thousands of years of human history, words got changed, stories got retold differently, and all of a sudden popped up this idea of a phoenix that supposedly builds a nest, lights it on fire, dives into it, and then is burnt up and is killed, and then out of the ashes rises its rebirth. Okay. 
What if the phoenix is real? And the reason why I'm asking that is I think she saw one. I think Betty Andreessen was initiated just like someone joining a secret society, only in her case, she saw it breathing. Okay? Uh, according to Wikipedia, the Phoenix myth or the Phoenix idea, you find a little glimpse of it in all these different ancient cultures. In Egypt, it was called the Bennu bird. Uh, the Bennu is an ancient Egyptian deity, so it's a god because it has wings, an angel, linked with the sun, creation, and, and rebirth. It may have been the inspiration for the phoenix in Greek mythology. According to Egyptian mythology, the Bennu was a self-created being said to have played, self-created, that sounds like evolution to me, uh, said to have played a role in the creation of the world. It is said to be the Ba of Ra and enabled the creative actions of Atom. It was said to have flown over the waters of Nun that existed before creation, landing on a rock and issuing a call that determined the nature of creation. It was also a symbol of rebirth and was therefore associated with Osiris. Don't forget that. That the Phoenix Bennu bird is associated with Osiris or Osiris, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Don't forget that. Just hold it in your mind for about five minutes, will you? Okay. Some of the titles of the Bennu bird were He Who Came Into Being By Himself and Lord of Jubilees. Dun, dun, dun. The latter epithet referred to the belief that the Bennu periodically renewed itself like the sun. Its name is related to the Egyptian verb wuban, meaning to rise in brilliance or to shine. When it says Lord of Jubilees and it talks about like the cycles of the sun, the Jubilee year in the Bible, if you remember, happened every what? 50 years. There was a period of seven years times seven years, 49 years, and the 50th year was a jubilee year, and it was a cycle. Every 50 years, you'd have the same thing. And what happened was people were, slaves were set free. Anybody who had a debt, the debt was canceled, didn't matter. This, this is what God instituted amongst the nation of Israel so that the rich would never get too much power like they have now power over debt and collection of debt and putting people into bondage over such debt. God said, you're not going to hold your brothers in bondage. You were in bondage back in Egypt. Remember that? You're not going to hold. God knew the Jews, didn't he? He knew the Jews for the Jews knew themselves. He said, you're not going to hold your own brethren in bondage. Every 50 years, doesn't matter how much money they owe you, their debt is canceled. And what that is a prototype, a picture of is Christ, our Jubilee, who is the one who satisfied our debt to make us free. We went from slave to free man. It didn't cost us anything because our debt was already paid. So you see the mockery of Christ. In the, and there, I went into a church one time, a Methodist church had stained glass on it, and one of the stained glass windows had a phoenix in it. And I'm just going, what is that doing here? Well, some people picked up on the idea of the phoenix, oh, that's a picture of Christ, because, you know, Christ, you know, and, no, he didn't burn. Christ didn't burn himself up. That's cr oh, crazy. Anyway, remember, I told you hang on to this idea about, you already forgot, didn't you? Osiris, Osiris? The Bennu bird is sort of related to Osiris because of resurrection. Osiris is the sun god and who dies, goes into the underworld, and is resurrected again every morning. Six o'clock in the morning happens, like clockwork, right? So, the, remember the name of the bird, the Bennu. Now, I don't know what all this... but. NASA has a weird thing of looking into the heavens and naming everything after a god or a deity of some kind, as if God hasn't already done that for them. 
But that's what NASA does. Apollo and Mercury and Gemini and Columbia, these are all gods and goddesses, all of them. So they discovered this, it looks like a cube, which is weird. But there's an asteroid out there that NASA named the Bennu. The Bennu is the phoenix. So NASA decided to send a uh, probe out to this asteroid, this flying thing in the heavens, right? Take a sample of it, scoop it up, and bring it back to Earth. And they called the craft that went out there Osiris Rex. Rex means king. King Osiris, the sun god from Egypt, who's related to the Bennu bird. Dun, dun, dun. Crazy. And w even though I don't, know ex I don't know exactly why they did that, why they named it that. NASA, like I said, NASA's weird that way. But it, to me, it shows you the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children. You don't have Bible-believing Christians running NASA, do you? Or running the government, for that matter. Okay? But it, it shows the pervasiveness of gods and goddesses, whereas... It could be said 100 years ago, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, we were a Christian people in this country. But are we now? No way, no how. We're not. Shows you the pervasiveness of the occult that has gotten in even into our scientific ideology. Where did the Big Bang come from? Well, the Jews developed that theory through their mysticism. Okay, and then of course you have the, the, um, in the Large Hadron Collider out in Europe, you have the image of Shiva, the, the destroyer god, who's dancing. And that shows the particle dance that they're trying to accelerate there. See that it's the inculcation of the occult into science. They're, they're mingling science and religion together, only they're leaving the Bible out of it. And that could be said of the whole UFO thing. There are the, the, uh, the people who study UFOs and aliens, they're the nuts and bolts type of people who are wondering at the biology of the aliens and the technology of their flying ships. But then you have the people who are going, these are our space brethren, these are the gods, these are our ascended masters, our spirit brothers, our spirit space brothers, they're here to help us change ourselves. You have those people, right? Well, they're mingling together. They're all, getting, they're all learning to get along. But they're leaving the Bible out of everything they do. In India, you have a version of the phoenixes, and, a, and what we're dealing with is a spirit, a god, a devil, a symbol of the man of sin, the Antichrist. And in India, you had the Garudas, which was, and notice how they're shaped, a power symbol found in India and other Indonesian nations, and a god in Hindu and Buddhist and Jain religions. This is a sort of compilation of things I read on Wikipedia and other places around the internet. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but the Garudas also were these humanoid, winged creatures that were symbolic of life or transformation or rebirth and all that other stuff that goes along with it. Chinese or Japanese mythology, very similar. It, it, it's funny that in all these mythologies, whether it's Egypt, Central South America, the Orient, India, wherever you go, Egypt, wherever you go, you have the same symbolism with different names. Manley Hall was right. There's one big gigantic secret. So you have the symbolism of some sort of God symbolized sometimes as a man or as a bird dying by various means, sometimes in a cruciform way, like on a cross, or sometimes burning up. 
but then rising again. So in Chinese mythology, we find the Feng Huang, the vermilion bird, the substance of the flame. The Feng has the head and comb of a pheasant and the tail of a peacock. It personifies the primordial force of the heavens. It is one of the four spiritually endowed or sacred, see that number four? Sacred creatures, and like the dragon and Kai Lin, with which it is always associated, it is both yin and yang, which is male and female, androgynous, good and evil, light and darkness. When it is the male Fing, it becomes yang, solar, the firebird, but as the Huang, it is feminine, yin and lunar, the moon. When portrayed with the dragon as a symbol of the emperor, the phoenix becomes entirely feminine as the empress, and together they represent both aspects of imperial power. Like the dragon and Kai Lin, the phoenix is made up of various elements typifying the entire cosmos. It has the head of a chicken, a rooster, the sun, the back of a swallow as the crescent moon. Its wings are the wind. Its tail represents the trees and flowers and its feet are the earth. You have the four elements. It has the five colors symbolizing the five virtues. Its color delights the eye. The comb expresses righteousness. Its tongue utters sincerity, its voice chants melody, its ears enjoy music, its heart conforms to regulations, its breast contains the treasures of literature, and its spurs are powerful against transgressors. This is from an ancient ritual. Now, I would look at that and say, a bird, right? I would not look at the feathers on its head and go, that symbolizes righteousness. That sounds made up, doesn't it? Like most of this language is symbolism. It doesn't have any real substance meaning to it. The Bible does. The feminine aspect, Huang, denotes beauty, delicacy of feeling, and peace. It is also a bridal symbol signifying inseparable fellowship. This is not only for the married couple, but for the complete yin-yang mutual interdependence in the universe in terms of duality. Duality is basically sons of God, daughters of men or iron and clay. That's Anytime you hear about the duad or the duality, I believe in duality. I believe in opposing forces. So I, I do this when I bow to you. That shows equality, duality, the yin and the yang coming together, or the Buddhist monk doing this, walking around like this. He is centered upon himself. He has the dual forces focused in his inner being. It's, it's, all, corru it's all corruption. It's all Daniel chapter 2. Iron and clay. That's what it's all about. Then we're going to bring in Kukulkan or Quetzalcoatl again. The feathered serpent. Come, various forms but Quetzalcoatl or Kukulkan from various Wikipedia sources, according to Aztec legends, Quetzalcoatl sacrifices himself by casting himself into a bonfire after adorning his regalia, which is his kingly adornment, usually feathers. For four days, he dwells in Mixlan, which is the Aztec underworld, where he makes darts. Think about that word. Fire and darts. Then the Aztec priests would burn beautiful birds, probably resembling Quetzalcoatl's regalia. That's my guess. So that Quetzalcoatl's spirit can ascend into heaven and become the morning star, which is the planet Venus. The fiery serpent makes darts in the underworld, right? Ephesians 6, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. <laughs> the phoenix, the firebird, the binu, is Satan and the Antichrist. That's who it is. He's making darts. He's making fiery darts. He's a god. That's, he's like Shiva. He's on fire. He's surrounded by flames, right? Shiva, the destroyer, this is all part and parcel of the same God idea, anti-Christ. The Native American cultures had him as the firebird, 
right, or the Thunderbird. Uh, you see representations of it here. Again, from Wikipedia sources, according to various Native American or First Nation legends, the Thunderbird controlled the upper world, which is the heavens, and think prince of the power of the air, like Satan is, like the fowls of the air in the parable of the seed and the sower, and throws lightning down to the earth and creates thunder with its wings. They are also messengers, the word angels. The Greek word angelos means messenger. They are messengers of the great sun. They are said to live in the four directions, north, south, east, and west. Notice this. This is what's really interesting to me. They're commonly depicted as having an appearance in the shape of an X or a cross. And see these three birds with, that look like an X? These are firebirds. These were the signatures of certain Indian chiefs. This is how they signed their name. Since they were chief and they wore the feathers, they were the firebird representation on the, they were a representation of the firebird god or the phoenix god on the earth. Just like Quetzalcoatl, if we go back and look at that, Quetzalcoatl is often depicted as dying on a cross or some sort of cruciformed platform, something like that. What is that all about? What is it that's in our body that looks like an X? There on the right is, um, is an old Indian, I think it's a medicine bag, and you see the firebird, the phoenix, uh, depicted there again with the X shape. Now compare that, what you see there, with this. See, Manley Hall tried to tell everybody his views of the symbol on the Great Seal of the United States of America. He didn't think it was really an eagle. He said, no, that's not an eagle. It's a phoenix because of the crop in certain representations. It has a crop of feathers on its head. And he said, eagles don't have that. And so whether you see the crop or not here, you see the X formation of the wings and the feet. Where did that all come from? The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience is where that comes from. That's the connection of it. Now, the symbolism of birds themselves in the scriptures. Mark chapter 4, I've been referencing this. Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came, devoured it up. When Jesus gives the meaning of it, he said, Satan cometh immediately. In Matthew 13, he calls him the wicked one. In Luke 8, he calls him the devil. Again, Ephesians 2, 2, the prince of the power of the air. That's what the wings, the wings have, whether it's the flapping wings or the tail wings, the tail feathers, they still have the power of the air. Where did Wirble, Wilbur and Orville Wright learn to build their first aeroplane from? Watching birds. That's why they put the thing at the back Instead of just having wings, you can't just have wings, you've got to have a stabilizer in the back. Because they watched birds and they saw birds use their tail feathers as stabilizers to control their direction, their pitch, their yaw, and everything else. Right? Okay? So that's the symbolism of birds. They represent spirits, in essence, but in this particular case, it would be evil spirits. Revelation 18.2, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the greatest fallen has fallen, has become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Psalm 104, this is going to connect the idea that these spirits are not just 
puffs of air. They're actually made of something probably similar to what we understand as fire, but undoubtedly different since it's in a different dimension. But these particular spirits are made of fire. Who make his angels spirits, his ministers of flaming fire. What was it that Elisha was going to show his servant that was going to rescue them from the army surrounding them? Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray that you open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man he saw. Behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Uh, Phoenix, Arizona, which is on the 33rd parallel, 33 degrees north. There's the symbol of the city of Phoenix. You know why, how it got the, its name? Uh, the guy who helped found the city knew that he was building a city on top of the ruins of where old Indian tribes had once settled because he knew they had built canals, they had built irrigation um, streams and different things like that. So he knew that there was a, an Indian nation there before. So he decided to call them and we're going to rise up from the ashes of who used to be here. We're going to build a new city on, from the old one. That's why he named it Phoenix. So get this, on the 33rd parallel, Phoenix, Arizona, and that number 33, because that double eagle on Manly on um, uh, Morals and Dogma, Fat Albert Pike's book, is like a phoenix, okay? And Phoenix, Arizona is the place without a doubt the single most solid view of a giant UFO ever witnessed, seen by thousands of people in Phoenix, Arizona, March 13th, 1997, hundreds, I think thousands of eyewitnesses report lights coming from the north, from the Estrella Mountains. You know what Estrella means? The Star Mountains near Phoenix, making this one of the largest mass UFO sightings ever. Happened Phoenix, Arizona. It came out of the north from the Estrella, the star. The, the Indians called them, these spirits, the star people. The star people live in the star mountain. That's where it came from. In, I passed a vehicle the other day. Is a heating and cooling guy who does you know, installs heating and cooling systems in buildings and homes. And I noticed that he called his company Phoenix Heating and Cooling. Now, this is St. Louis, not Phoenix, Arizona. Why did he call it that? Probably because of the heating part. But the Phoenix logo and idea is a very, very popular thing in popular culture, advertising, branding, Phoenix Technologies, the Phoenix Company of Chicago, Phoenix Towing, Phoenix Ignition, Phoenix Solar, Phoenix Consulting, uh, Phoenix, Phoenix Associates, and you see it everywhere. So I had to watch, I've, I have never watched a Harry Potter movie and I've never read any Harry Potter book. So I didn't buy the Harry Potter, I wasn't going to read, what, 900 pages? Good grief. So I rented the Harry Potter movie and what Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Now it does mention a secret society that Harry's mother and father belong to called the Order of the Phoenix. So I rented the movie and watched it. And it didn't have a thing to do with the Phoenix. Maybe it's in the book. I, maybe I missed it. Maybe they couldn't put it in the movie. But there was a secret society that Harry's parents were part of called the Order of the Phoenix. This I know about because I'm a child of the 70s and 80s. I grew up, I was born in 66, so I grew up 
half of the latter half of the 60s, all through the 70s. 70s were my decade, into the 80s. I was married in 87. But this was one of my, by far, one of my favorite cartoon TV shows. Battle of the Planets, transmute. And these, it, this was really the introduction to Japanese, that and Speed Racer, Japanese animation, anime, into American culture. Uh, Battle of the Planets, these five teenagers, got to be teenagers or kids, right, or they wouldn't watch it. These five teenagers, they transform themselves into these flying gods, and they all fly these flying ships that when they form, they can all form together, and in every episode, that phoenix ship had to change and catch fire so that it could defeat, who was it? Volton or something like that, with the, the arch enemies. The same guy showed up in every episode, 85 episodes, I think it was. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, I'm going through popular culture and showing you the, the Phoenix bird, every, and, and I'm going to end with the one I hate the most. Queen had an album called A Day at the Races, and they featured the Phoenix bird um, in their world tour in 1977. Queen. Queen, really? Because that leads up to the Queen. Now, uh, I'm not going to turn. Yeah, maybe I will turn there. If you remember the Eurovision contest, Eurovision is sort of like American Idol. 2015, a guy who goes by the stage name of Conchita Wurst. Take a look at him. This is his, yes, he's a sodomite. Yeah, he is. Okay. But he doesn't really consider himself a transgendered. This is just what he does on stage. He has the face of a man, the hair of a woman. So he won the contest in 20. He won with this song called Rise Like a Phoenix. Here's the lyrics to it. Waking in the rubble, walking over glass. Neighbors say we're trouble. Well, that time has passed. Peering from the mirror. Think Betty Andreessen in this. No, that isn't me. Stranger getting nearer. Who can this person be? You wouldn't know me at all today from the fading light I fly. Rise like a phoenix out of the ashes, seeking rather than vengeance, retribution. You were warned. Once I'm transformed, once I'm reborn, you know I will rise like a phoenix, but you're my flame. Guess who wrote that song? The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You thought I was going to name like Elvis or something. No, I don't know who I don't. I don't know who wrote it, but I guarantee you it was inspired by the Prince of the Power of the Air, and it sort of gives this idea that there is something coming, waiting behind the scenes, ready to transform everybody, and it will, with. One exception. Of course, the face of a man and the hair of a woman, that's Revelation 9. The devils that rise up out of the pit, they have the face of man, hair of a woman. And the pit is on fire and smoke, right? You get that? I understand now you understand that. Because, and the phoenix is the king over them, which is Abaddon and Apollyon, the destroyer. And yes, there's a transformation coming. Take a look at this picture. I've used this illustration before. The poison darnel or tares look like wheat when everything's green. All of the humans, over 7 billion people on the planet right now, some of them are born again Christians. So God's not going to just go kill everybody just because there's a lot of wicked people in the world. He's going he's to wait until 
all of us are not green anymore. He's going to wait until the transformation has taken place. Because the tares turn black, like coal, charred coal. The wheat turns golden like the sun of righteousness, right? And that, of course, Matthew 13. While men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. That's what I said. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Go, gather ye together first the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them, gather the wheat in my barn. You see the phoenix symbolism here. The tares are burnt. And the, the transformation is the harvest because when the harvest comes, both are transformed. They're no longer green anymore. There's a change in them both. This is what I believe 1 Peter 1, 23 is telling us. Some are going to be born again of corruptible seed, some of incorruptible seed. And then, and then it's going to be known out of all the 7 billion people on the earth right now, I promise you, God will not make any mistakes on who is and who isn't his own. So my question to you is, are you God's? own child are you born again of the incorruptible seed of the word of god i hope you are and if not you call upon the name of the lord and god knows your heart god knows who he can save who's being honest who isn't god knows call upon the name of the lord and thou shalt be saved you're the reason why i do what i do thank you for praying for me my wife from all of us here at Bethel Church, God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.